Hey, I'm Jad Abumran. I'm Robert Krulwich. Today on Radio Lab, blame. In the story we just heard, we were wrestling with a very difficult question. When somebody has a brain injury and commits a crime, just how much do we blame them and how much do we blame the brain? Yeah, and as it turns out, this question... Hi. Hi, this is Jad. Hi, Jad. It's Nita. That question is popping up more and more in court cases, where increasingly you will find defendants like Kevin arguing... Okay, you've convicted me of a crime, but you should go easier on me because I have these neurological problems. So this is Nita Farahani. Professor of Law and Philosophy and Professor of Genome Sciences and Policy at Duke University. She's been following this whole sort of emerging field of neuro law for quite a while. And back in 2006, it occurred to her. Okay, lots of people are interested in this field, but nobody has any good data. So I started counting cases to try to see. To try to see how many times does brain science come up in court. Now, the only data that she'd get her hands on were written opinions, Hmm. which turns out doesn't happen that often, like really only happens in like 1% of court cases. But But in that 1% of cases, she saw a steady increase and, you know, relatively dramatic. You you have a couple of years, 2005 and 6, at about 100 cases, 2007, 8, 9, 200 some cases, and then 11, 12, you're in the 300s. All told, between 2005 and 2012, it's about 1,600 cases. But 1,600 cases that are kind of like the Kevin case, where someone maybe argues, look, uh, it's not entirely my fault. My brain made me do it. At least a little bit. Yeah. And by the way, that number was just in the 1% she had access to. So the other 99% of cases may actually have a whole lot more. Yeah. Well, wait a second. Is this a new development? What do you mean? Like, you know, in West Side Story, there's this character, Officer Crumpke, and he goes, and there's these juvenile delinquents, this is back in the 50s, and they're saying everything is someone else's fault. So they have bad parents, and they have poverty, and they have passion, and they have youth, and they plead all these things. Dear, kindly Sergeant Krupke, you gotta understand, it's just our bringing up key that gets us out of hand. Our mothers all are junkies, our fathers all are drunk. If you just add it to the list, tumor, that's pretty much the same thing. Well... Maybe? No. There seems to be something more compelling for both judges and juries when you are able to have actual brain scans. You know, or EEG or whatever, because now you can say to to Officer Krumpke, look, I know this might sound like an excuse, but check out this spot right here. Here's the proof. I don't have a normal brain, you know, and I didn't choose not to have a normal brain, so how can it be completely my fault? Well, doesn't that sound a little bit like uh, a little too easy? Maybe. I mean... I guess it depends on the specific case, but just in the abstract, let me give you the best version that I've ever heard of this argument. Okay. Uh, This is what what made me really stop and think. It comes from from a psychologist, Kevin Dutton. He was interviewed on the Scientific American podcast, and he gave this hypothetical. Uh, Imagine if you've got a deaf person, okay, and you've got uh, a child in a burning building, and you've got that child screaming out, but the deaf person can't hear the screams. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily blame, you wouldn't hold that deaf person culpable uh, for that child's death if the child died. You agree so far? Yes. By the same token, if you are emotionally deaf, if you can physically hear the screams, but emotionally you just don't have that kind of neural kick up the backside to go in and save that child, isn't that the same thing? (laughs) And when you start thinking about that, there's a whole kind of moral conundrum that starts coming out of that because damage to the ear is damage to a physical structure. Damage to the brain is also damage to a physical structure. So here's the moral conundrum I think he's referring to. If we go along with this idea that we can use brain abnormalities to defend ourselves in court. Well, that's going to lead us into some pretty weird places. As a society, things may get very, very complicated. As we learned, we got into a little tussle. All right. Okay. With this guy. Sorry, so you put this on. Well, it is a little chilly in here. This is David Eagleman. I'm a neuroscientist. He's a uh, regular on our show. Is that what I'm supposed to say or no? Very spirited regular. Yeah. No, here's one of the most interesting parts. Here's his argument. Think about it technologically at the moment. Our best technologies in neuroscience are very crude. We can see when someone has a tumor or damage from traumatic brain injury or neurodegenerative disease, but it is quite crude still. The way he puts it, looking for those brain abnormalities now is sort of like being up in space and looking down at the earth. You can't really see what's going on down there, but you can see the big shapes and the colors. And every so often, you notice something that's not supposed to be there. Like, whoa, 
What is that crater over there? If you see something that's big enough to see, you take a picture, you're back in court, you show it to the judge, and maybe she gives the guy a break. But then, say you're up there and... Uh, mission control. Everything looks normal from up here. You don't see anything. Well, then, back in court, the judge is going to take a look at your apparently normal brain and say, sorry. Well, that's your fault. It's not a biological problem. So we're just going to say you're blameworthy. So that's where we are now. We draw the line at what we can see, and what we can see is only the big stuff. But, he says, imagine forward. We'll have new technologies. We'll have XMRI instead of fMRI. And suddenly it's going to be like Google Maps, where instead of being up in space, you can... You can zoom in, and now you can see everything. We'll have new names for disorders of the microcircuitry and so on. We'll certainly never get all the way to the end. But one day, we may be able to say, like, see that little bit of mangled wiring right over there? That is because his mom didn't love him enough, or maybe he got bullied. Like, we, we'll be able to see all that stuff almost as well as we can see brain tumors now. Because there is nothing special about brain tumors except for their visibility. Really what he's saying when you get down to it, his core belief is that you are your biology. Which is on some level kind of like whatever, duh. But he takes it much farther. He says that almost everything that you go through in your life, all of your experiences, your culture, your history, your neighborhood, all of it, is etched into the tissue of your brain. Right. There's nothing separate. Nothing. Descartes famously suggested you've got the body, you know, the physical stuff, and then you've got this extra bit, the soul, the ghost in the machine. But sort of the, you know, the inside word on that neuroscience is that, eh, no, no, no. It's all the same thing. And now that we're beginning to see that, he says, actually see it, we are on a slippery slope. Because if you start letting people off the hook when you see a tumor, well, then you're going to have to keep letting them off the hook when you see something smaller. Or smaller. Or smaller still. The point is, it cannot be a just legal system that in one decade says, well, you're blameworthy. Because for the moment, we can't see anything in your brain. And then the next decade says, oh, you have Schmedley's disease. Hey, we can see it now. And we didn't realize that. So now you, we're lumping you over here with the people with the brain tumors. So then what does that mean? Like that we, we have to let everybody off the hook? No, no. Blameworthiness is the wrong question for a legal system to ask. That's the point is that this whole notion about blameworthiness and saying, okay, if we have a biological mitigator, then we'll bring that up in court and we'll say, well, it's not exactly his fault. And if we don't have a biological mitigator will say it is his fault. The reason none of this makes sense nowadays is because saying, was it the person's fault or was it something about his biology doesn't make sense as a question. They are inseparable. Well, I, I, got, I, have, I have a version of that question. How about everybody should know that his brain isn't completely normal in this regard. And now the question is proportion. How much do you want to put on the brain and how much do you want to put on his... And what else is there? behavior which of, comes from his where? ability to choose from the brain, his choosy part of his brain, as opposed to his unchoosy part. <laughs> well, that's okay. That, no, that's I'm where glad, you're forcing me. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're phrasing it this way because that's exactly the problem with our intuitions. We have this intuition that, yeah, your brain might look like this. You have these genes. You have these experiences. That makes your biology like this. Oh, but in the end, that doesn't matter because you've got this other thing that's independent of the biology. But we don't. You are no, your brain. No, no. Bra your brain, however, nevertheless helps you decide things. Brains help you choose. So the question I'm who's asking... Who's the you that they're helping? Who's the you that you're helping? The bearer of the brain, the owner of the brain. The, 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 and that's the, separate from the brain? Well, oh, God. Do you own Why do you keep doing this to me? I know that if I have a Tootsie Roll in front of me and an M&M, I can choose the M&M. So I assume my brain is doing something. And the question I want to ask is, like, how much am I choosing and how much am I really outside of choosing? Because some... Something irregular in my brain is choosing for me. And that seems to me to be a way to do it. So, so this, but this is fascinating because the way you're phrasing it suggests that there's, um, there's you and then there's your brain and there's things in your brain that might be telling you what you don't want to do. But it's all one system is the thing. So when you're faced with the Tootsie Roll versus the whatever else. M&M. &M. M &M, everything in your life leading up to that moment from your genetic history written on invisibly small strands of nucleic acids all the way up to every experience <laughs> you've ever had leads to that choice. What would it even mean to make a choice completely independent of your brain? Okay, wait, I'd like to... One more time. I, 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 I promise I won't. What about like the Ten Commandments? 
Those are like the those are those are. Okay, I'm just gonna jump in for a second. At this point, things kind of slid off the rails. We ended up talking about the Ten Commandments, debating the question of free will. If free will exists at all, it's a really small part of this system. No. We went back and forth about whether you can overcome your upbringing, which obviously you can. Oh gosh, no, you can't. Sure, you can. No, you can't. You, I, I can go to the library and I can. That's read only a bunch if you're of... that type of person. Anyhow, after an hour, we finally got back around to David's main point, which is that the legal system would be a hell of a lot better off, he says. If uh, if we forgot about blame altogether, forget if it's someone's fault, that's a dead end, he would say. The better way to do it, he thinks, is to focus on this. Probability of future recidivism. You mean like, will they do it again? That's right. That's exactly it. Well, how would you ever know? So here's how. You crunch the numbers. So this has already happened in the world of sex offenders, where um, there have been uh, long-term studies following out... Here's the way it already works, he says, which he thinks is model. When a sex offender comes up for parole, someone at the corrections office will grab their record and ask a bunch of questions. What was the victim choice? Was it somebody they knew or was it somebody outside of their family? Was it a, a minor? Was the victim male or female? Was it somebody their age? What was the crime type? All these different questions. Then the evaluator will take some of the answers and give them points. Three, zero, two, one. Two. That's psychologist Amy Phoenix. She says researchers developed this point system based on years of studies of criminal behavior, massive amounts of data. And once you have all these points down... You can add up a total score. And that score is supposed to tell you, is this guy likely to do it again or not? And here's the bottom line. Amy says, if you were to ask a parole officer with decades of experience to just use their gut, no numbers. We call that unguided clinical judgment. If you were to ask them for their unguided but expert clinical judgment. Will Fred here recidivate or not? What's your prediction? According to studies, those experts are correct. About 50% of the time. So you may as well flip a coin. On the other hand, she says, if you have people just use the point system, no gut involved. The predictive accuracy would be about 70%. Wow, 70%, yeah. no humans involved. Yeah. A... But, but here's the thing that sort of gives me pause. Like, in order to get that accurate, you kind of have to turn people into data, you know, yeah. into types. I know it seems like, oh, where's the humanity in that? But, but the question we have to ask is, compared to what? So the way it currently goes... Ugly people get much longer sentences than attractive people in courts. This is a well-known bias from juries. Is that somehow better than having a scientifically informed legal system? Hmm. I have no response to that. I, Damn I, it. I, well. <laughs> but Rulich? Robert will. Yes. <laughs> Robert? <laughs> yes. It's okay that pretty people get better sentences than ugly people. What? Wait, what? Because, I, mean, I don't know, I'm going out on the limb and see what happens when I finish the sentence. There you go. <laughs> because what we're describing here is humans judging humans, not tables judging humans, not data judging humans, but humans judging humans. So humans do that with a certain amount of humanness, and maybe it's not very rational, and maybe sometimes it's wrongheaded or unfair. But if you take the judgment away from the humans and you give it to a table, then you invite a different set of problems, which is the chance for mercy, which is a very big part of justice, is off the table because statistics don't have mercy. They just have statistics. Amen. Okay. I, that I was, was I'm, okay. nicely done. <laughs> Robert's <laughs> pleased with that. But let me, let me say, I let that me that say a couple... Beautiful question. That, yeah, that is a beautiful question. So the notion of... We should be merciful and so on. Of course, that's all true. But the question is, are we good at it? Are we good at knowing who is the right person to be merciful with? It ends up usually being the attractive person, right? And the person who's ugly and is missing teeth, we're usually not as merciful for. I wish this weren't. All right, let me just throw in one more objection to this. Uh, I mean, obviously, he has a point. I guess so. But this whole thing that he's advocating for, and he's not the only one, of throwing out blame, focusing instead on what someone might do. Is that a world you would want to really live in? Nita Farahani, that law professor, put it this way. Imagine you do something small. So if I, you know, forge a check. Minor offense. And in the process of arresting me and convicting me. Maybe the courts do a brain scan. Or they do that number crunchy thing. Exactly. The and they determine, actually, she has a predilection for far more serious crimes than check forging. I mean, she hasn't done any of those things yet, but she could rob a bank. She could commit a violent crime. That's what the data shows. 
If all you're worried about is what she might do... Then you can keep me in prison forever because um, what you've discovered is that I pose a real and future danger to society. I mean, you could basically convict someone of a crime that... That hasn't happened yet. Exactly. And not only that, if you think about this whole thing from a slightly higher altitude, according to Nita, when you blame somebody for something, there's a power to that act that goes beyond that one individual. There is value to society holding people morally accountable for wrongdoing. You're, you're upholding this code that is important to all of us. It's what we've lived by and clung to for thousands of years. Yeah. And so you could argue that the act of assigning blame is sort of like reinforcing the scaffolding of society. It creates norms for people to follow. That makes perfect sense to me. Otherwise, we would be... Well, we would be like, I don't know what we'd be. So, hey, so you're coming out for the Ten Commandments at the end of the day. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Hold on. No, shh. Hold let, on. Let, let's just say he went there and he can't take it back. Don't draft me onto that team. By the way.